May all beings be happy. May all beings be healthy. May all beings be free from harm. May all beings love life. May all beings awaken. Welcome to another Guk Audio podcast. I'm D.C. Bubov, Guk Audio and Guk Archives, preserving the legacy of Shunju Suzuki and those whose paths crossed his and anything else that comes to mind. I pray that you and yours are safe and comfortable, free from economic uh, hardship, and able to get out and do whatever it is you want within the limitations of the universal precept of do as little harm as possible. Uh, Today uh, we have another uh, few pieces from Dasahara Stories, a work in progress. So uh, just as soon as uh, we've uh, had our pause to meditate, we'll get right into that and hear the first one. So when you hear the bell, hit pause, if you wish and meditate or whatever for as long as you wish. And when you're ready to come back, hit unpause. And we will be here to hit the bell to end the meditation. Screams. Screams from the next room. Jim and Jeb were at it again. Jim was rolfing him. Rolfing. Structural integration as taught by Ida Roth at Esalen Institute had the reputation of being brutal and painful Invasive bodywork, and yet many people swore by it. Gasps from next door. Jim had gone through the full series of treatments, from toes to nose, and maybe had studied it some. I peeked in through the half-open door. Made me cringe to watch as Jim's naked, bony, sweating, bald body sat on Jeb's naked, bony, sweating, bald body as he dug his elbow into the ladder's back. The pain is a sign that you're uptight there, he said. Breathe into it. Resistance will make it worse. And don't vocalize. But Jeb couldn't help but vocalize as in groan and cry. It was at times like living next door to a torture chamber. <laughs> the first three creekside cabins beyond the bridge over Cabarga Creek had two rooms on each side with a sink and toilet in a back room. During guest season, we'd double up, but afterwards each would have their own room. Bob and I were on the left, and they were on the right of our cabin. We all four were influenced by the macrobiotic diet philosophy of George Osawa and drew from other health food regimens. As for Tatsahara at large, there was a tug of war going on between the cooked food and raw food factions from the first, Baker preferred salads to cooked vegetables and potatoes to rice. He said those of us into rice, sesame, and so forth ate seeds like birds. Whole grains and cooked food definitely won out, but there were still some white rice, potatoes, raw veggies, and salads. The number one evil 
agreed by various schools of food fetishism was sugar. The most fanatic among us saw a connection not only between diet and health, but diet and state of mind and spiritual progress. The sensitive and sincere head cook Ed Brown was an omnivore. He'd put a small amount of sugar in the bread we ate. Some students would beg him not to do that and castigate him for poisoning us. Bob and I thought it best to consume as much of this poison as possible so that our fellow students would be spared. Suzuki was for plain food, but primarily he wanted us not to obsess about it and eat what was offered. In the early months we were there, I'd been doing a lot of cooking before Ed arrived, and after that, until the guest season started in May, worked with him in that tiny old kitchen. For breakfast, we were mainly serving hot cereal like oatmeal or brown rice cream with an array of condiments to cover everyone's preferences. Thus, there was milk, white sugar, brown sugar, honey, yeast, sesame salt, milk, and I can't remember what else. I made the sesame salt, learned how from Loring back at our Buchanan Street apartment. He made his in a ceramic suribachi with pestle. Not like the normal Japanese gamashio with a few black seeds in the salt, but 16 parts roasted whole brown sesame to one part roasted sea salt ground up together in our Portland hand mill. Vast volumes of it were used by us all on the brown rice and other grains and veggies served. One morning, I was in charge of breakfast and just served the oatmeal with sesame salt. None of the other condiments. A number of people were clearly not pleased to have their choices removed, but it was a silent meal so they could only express themselves with eye daggers. I wondered if I'd gone too far. I was definitely pushing my trip on others. At the conclusion of the meal, Suzuki spoke. He said, You all notice that there is only gumashio with the grain this morning. That's because we should be experiencing the essence of the grain. From now on, that's how we'll be serving the morning cooked cereal. Because Suzuki, who did not weigh in on every issue, said that, I got no feedback. It looked like I'd just been following orders. After that, nothing but gamacio was served with the meals as a condiment, even when Baker became avid and was not at all a big fan of it. Suzuki's teaching to eat what was served without discrimination gave Bob and me permission to eat everything in sight while preaching our preference of simple fare, but left Jem and Jeb torn between two rigid ideals best expressed in their leader Jim's tea-time dilemma. In the afternoon, there was a tea break. Sometimes there would be fruit or a small treat. One could partake or not. Most people were happy to get the cookie and didn't care what it had in it. On four and nine days, we'd have a sit-down tea with treat. As I approached the dining room one such afternoon, Jim came out looking distressed. I don't know what to do, he whimpered. There's a cookie with sugar that will be served today. If I eat it, it will have a bad effect on my consciousness and practice. And if I don't, I will not be following Suzuki Roshi's teaching to accept what is offered. He broke down and started sobbing. I told him I would eat his cookie for him, thus relieving him of all practice-oriented obligations. 
<laughs> Later that day, I heard him berating Jeb for eating the cookie and thus lowering the overall spiritual vibration of their quarters and practice relationship. Jim and Jeb, which means Jeb going along with Jim, had created rules and schedule for the two of them that was superimposed over the existing Tassahara rules and schedule. It included extra zazen and study, other rules for conduct, such as a more strict code of silence, small talk not allowed. There were also strictures in regard to food and drink consumption. It was by then practice period, so except for the four and nine day off, fourth, ninth, etc., we were eating three meals a day, Oriyoki style, in the Zendo. The first two meals had three bowls each, and dinner was only two bowls in which leftovers were served. The grain would go in the first bowl, served with a ladle or paddle. Many, especially males, would take as much as they could. Soup in the second could take two ladles, and salad or vegetable in the third, two helpings with serving spoons or tongs. Calling each ladle a serving, Jim calculated how many were offered a day, not including seconds, which were off-limits to them, and they agreed on reducing the number allowable to them by one-third. After all, they were only eating to the extent necessary to sustain consciousness in order to practice the Buddha way and strive toward enlightenment and the liberation of all sentient beings. Hard sitting, hard working, mainly young people on a vegetarian diet ate enthusiastically at every meal. The guys definitely ate more than the gals. Actually, men need to eat more to produce the same amount of energy as women. But Jim and Jeb were eating less than most of the women while sitting up righteously and chewing each bite 50 times, as Osawa suggested. Jim created a chart which was tacked to the redwood board wall of his room and on which each of them could write the number of servings and ladles they had accepted for each meal. After dinner one day, I overheard Jim's review of how well they'd done that week. Jeb had fallen short. He'd had four extra servings. Jim was distraught. How can I practice with you if you won't follow the rules we've agreed on? He cried out. Jeb was apologizing, sniffing, begging for forgiveness. I feared he'd have a breakdown. Poor guy. A couple of hours previously, I'd seen him shoveling gravel for a cement pour. They were reading the same sutra and had time to discuss it, in which Jim would tend to explain what it meant to an obedient Jeb. They sat next to each other for the early morning study period in the dining room. That was a practice period when there was a monitor who periodically walked around the room, waking those nodding and checking to make sure people were reading something Buddhist or practice-oriented. One morning, the monitor stopped at Jeb, who had been staring blankly, and urged him to return to reading. Jim leaned over and scolded the monitor, saying that Jeb might have just had an enlightenment experience and was being absorbed in the white light, and the monitor might be interfering with his becoming a never-returner by disturbing him that way. Jeb returned to reading. Heavy March rains had swelled the creek to such an extent that it took away the bridge to the baths. I stood looking at the incredibly fierce flow with its thunderous sound and 
watched branches and whole trees being swept downstream swiftly, could hear boulders being moved beneath their surface. There was a large sycamore tree that leaned over the creek next to where there had been a bridge. Up in the shop, Paul and Niels were preparing boards and supports for a temporary bridge. Jim, Bob, and I brought long runs of heavy three-quarter-inch rope. Uh, there were already spikes driven into the leaning sycamore trunk for climbing up. Bob, who was great at heights, was to scoot across the narrowing trunk to a spot above the baths. Bob tied the rope around his waist and started to climb up. I grabbed him and said, You are not going up there without safety gear. Jim spoke. If he is mindful, he will not fall. What? You think he's perfectly mindful all the time, and if not, he deserves to die? I spoke in a loud, irritated voice. He will not go up without safety gear. No one was in charge, but there are times. Mm. Bob put on the safety gear that kept him tied to the tree till he undid it. It did slow him down, but we were in no hurry. It was still scary watching him slowly crawl up and along the trunk, leaning above the torrent. We lowered him down onto the roof of the bathhouse, and soon we had two lengths of rope stretched above the creek. Three foot wide four by fours with holes at the far sides for the rope to go through had planks nailed on top and pushed toward the baths until a walkway was created. There were no handrail ropes yet. For that, we needed something to hold them, a beam to be placed behind the sides of a thick, wide opening at the men's plunge. The beam was a heavy, maybe eight foot long six by ten or so, I was to carry it across, balancing on the walkway, which swung to the side somewhat and was only a couple of feet above the rushing, threatening flow. Where's Niels, I wondered. He could dance across that. Bob would be better at it, too, but he was on the other side. About halfway over, my weight had lowered the bridge in the making so that the water was lapping at my feet, but the walkway was reasonably steady. I carried the beam like a tightrope walker carries the balancing pole, then one end dipped a bit into the rushing water which grabbed hold of it. I fought, tried to pull it back. I could hear fearful voices yelling, Let go! Let it go! and I realized I had to. In an instant, it zoomed away from me at incredible speed, quickly disappearing into the downstream distance. I had a strong flash of loss that, in retrospect, seems archetypal, like losing a loved one in such an emergency situation. There was another beam, and on the second attempt, that beam and I made it across. Soon there were two rope handrails with vertical lengths connected to the walkway rope every few feet. It all held together, designed and overseen by Paul, and tightened with trucker's hitches by Nils, so that it stayed well above the fray. It was a couple of months before we had a replacement bridge. Lost it, too, another year. A few of us sat on the steps to the dorm. Bob and Jim were arguing some long-forgotten Dharmic point. Bob had a sort of folksy way with words. Jim was more eloquent and self-assured. He knew his stuff, too. Sounded good to me. He was shiny and smiled in a beautific manner with gesture and countenance like a holy figure from a film. Bob looked him in the eye. Oh, yeah, he said, and hauled off and slapped Jim in the face. Jim recoiled and cried out, You can't do that! Bob slapped him again. 
Jim stood his ground, insisting that Bob is not allowed to express himself that way in a monastery or in civil society. After a third slap, Diane intervened, calling out, Tea time! and led Jim by the hand to a table under the grape arbor with hot and cold refreshments and cookies with sugar. Sisters Just after leaving the village of Carmel Valley, on the way east to Keshawa, Jamesburg, Arroyo Seco, or Greenfield, there was a nice Spanish stucco place down a bit off the road to the right. On a good day, Joan Baez, whose place it was, might be sitting outside talking with friends or playing music. You could drive in and say hi. She was friendly, political, always ready to sing. Baez came to Tassajara as a guest now and then. Everyone liked her. I first heard her in Dallas in 1964. She didn't make a big deal out of herself. She'd come in one time and be silent and austere, and the next in the evening drinking wine, singing, and playing guitar in her cabin with friends. No one complained that she kept them up. Next day she was at the pool playing requests for a small group of students and guests. When someone asked for Dylan's love as just a four-letter word, she made a face and shook her head. I can see her singing Amazing Grace at the Steps by Gossip Oak on her way out. What a voice. She left one time with a guest student who had planned to stay longer, but mm, she was mighty attractive. Were people outraged? <laughs> Not that I heard, and I was head monk at the time. What I heard was, lucky guy. Bill Shirtliff was a Tassajara student who'd lived in Baez's Palo Alto commune. He admired her greatly, and his brother Jeffrey, who sang and recorded with Baez. She was refusing to pay income tax for a time in protest to the Vietnam War. The men were draft resistors, wouldn't register, burn their cards. When Baez came as a guest, Bill was already off living in Japan and on his way to becoming a foremost authority on soy products. Baez's sister, Pauline, lived in Jamesburg with Peyton. For a while, he had a cool joint in the village, Carmel Valley Village. The Encounter Coffee Shop was the last place on the right and thus the last commercial anything going east on that road. The name was appropriate for the area as Encounter Groups had been made famous at Esalen Institute and Ed Farrington, a neighbor of Peyton's at Jamesburg, was leading Encounter Groups in the area. I was sorry when the encounter folded. There was nothing else like it. Later, Peyton got in trouble for some of his farming practices in a hidden Jamesburg clearing. Peyton and Pauline were good to drop by for a visit on the way in or out of Tassajara. Real backwoodsy field, dark wood walls aloft, comfy couch, an overstuffed chair, hammock, We'd play some music, drink a little, smoke a little. He had a few makeshift huts and hangout spots on the side of the hill and dug a shallow cave good for some cozy time alone. The Tassajara criminal element were comfortable there. Tommy was close to them. Pauline co-authored Pack Up Your Sorrows with Richard Farina, who recorded it with Pauline's other sister, Mimi. To me, that was the most magical album of the mid-sixties, and I loved that song. I'd thought it was a traditional folk gospel until I read it was half hers. She kept a low profile. I've used it for background music, playing inside my head, taking a walk. Helps to drop the cares and woes from the heart through the floor. 
A lot of non-theistic spiritual seekers, such as Buddhists, can't get into any religious message that uses Christian-type wording, but I can thanks to my father who taught me how to interpret it. If somehow you could pack up your sorrows and give them all to me, if somehow you could pack up your sorrows and give them all to me, do, 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 you would lose them. I know how to use them. Give them all to me. Sounds like there's someone off somewhere else who will somehow take what's hurting you from afar. Not in my understanding that me Give them all to me is just our big mind, as Suzuki termed it. Where rational thought fails, the song offers a metaphor for not dwelling on yet dealing with suffering. Baya's center buds aren't there anymore, but to this day I cannot drive by that place without looking down, remembering her and the scene there and thinking of a sad day. In 1965, it was on the occasion of the book release party for Richard Farina's novel, Been Down So Long It Looks Like Up. It was hosted by the Thunderbird Bookstore, located then in the village. Later, at his wife's 21st birthday party, he went out for a quick, fun motorcycle ride with a friend who drove way too fast headed toward Kashawa. That road has turns that you can't even make driving the speed limit. There's an S-curve at one spot that sometimes catches me by surprise, and I've got to brake pretty hard. That's where I imagine they went off the road through the fence at what the cops estimated to be 90. The driver lived. Breakdown Driving Suzuki to San Francisco in my old Volvo, there was a place not far north of the turnoff for Monterey where the highway divided, curved, and went through a long grove of trees and even some boulders. While descending a slope in that part of the road, the car lost power. Fortunately, there was a lone service station at the bottom of the incline which I coasted into. I was pleased to see a garage with a lift for working on cars and asked the man running the place if there was a mechanic about. He took a look at bald-headed me and Suzuki in his travel robes, grimaced, scratched his head, looked away, then back and sighed. A mechanic lives up there, he said, and he works at the station some, but he's a troubled guy. His wife just ran off because he beat her. Been in trouble with the police about that and other things. Angry guy. He got screwed up in the Korean War. The man hemmed and hawed a bit, searching for words. Doesn't take to those people well, he said, slightly nodding towards Suzuki, and he'll probably refuse to help you. He sits up there and broods most of the time. Got a drinking problem. Maybe better off getting a toe back to Salinas. Uh, that was quite a job recommendation. <laughs> but I said, we'll try him. Which house? First one up the hill. At the door, we could hear the TV was on. He came right away. No doubt I'd been prejudiced after such an introduction, but I thought I did feel a wave of hostility and pain emanate from the house when he opened the door. I told him my car had broken down and asked if he could maybe help. I didn't have much of a Texas accent, but with some people it instinctively resurrected. And I know not to mouth off, be direct, respectful, brief. I could see pain in his face. He asked what type of car it was, who was this guy with me, and what did he do? I said through the screen door that he's a Zen master and I'm his student. He was quiet for a moment, and then invited us in and asked us to sit down on his couch. The fellow didn't appear to have been drinking, but his place smelled a little rank. 
He offered his black instant coffee with sugar and found some Oreo cookies, which he placed in front of him. The three of us drank and ate the Oreo, sat there, us in no hurry, were at his mercy. The mechanic's posture had drained since he first eyed us, and his face was softening. The anger which had been screaming from his pores was dissipating, and he was sitting with us somewhat awkwardly, like a kid, shy in the presence of a visiting elder. There were a few words spoken, names exchanged, where were we going? Then he asked Suzuki, how could he be a better person? I don't remember what the answer was, or if Suzuki mentioned Buddhism, surely not much, but I remember us sitting there comfortably with someone most people would not at all want to sit with. It was the most ordinary of social interactions. I think there was nothing that Suzuki said to the guy in words that mattered as much as what he said with his body, his presence. I guess it could be interpreted as a version of I'm okay, you're okay. Maybe I'm Buddha, you're Buddha. Uh, the mechanic insisted we stay in his house while he went to look at the car, which he fixed within half an hour. Meanwhile, Suzuki fell asleep as soon as we were alone, and I watched Leave It to Beaver. So, there we have some more Tatsuhara stories. Tatsuhara and surroundings. Uh, so I've just gone over it. I got the fan on the third speed. And... Uh, I keep it on the first one when I record because that doesn't make much noise. But I'll just leave it here. Uh, so, it's getting late. Bedtime. Thanks a lot for joining us. So, until next time, this is DC Puba of Gook Audio and Gook Archives coming to you from Sleepy Sanur with Dog at Bandita, Feline Cuchita, and dear lovely Katrinka. And we're wishing you and yours and all of us a grand awakening. <laughs>